Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Jen Woodside, a director in alumni relations here at UNH. And this is our second webinar that's part of our in-depth on inclusion series. And we will be continuing the series throughout the fall and next year. So we will continue to advertise and let you know about different topics that are coming up. We are joined today by Kate Slater. Kate is a white anti-racist scholar and educator. She's a doctoral candidate in educational leadership and policy studies programs program here and a lecturer for the course Teaching Race, um, also here at UNH. Kate's article about how to support black colleagues um, current, during the current situation was recently featured on the Today Show and she's working on a podcast and is often asked to speak at regional and national educational programs. We are honored that Kate is sharing her expertise with us today. We will definitely have time for question and answer later. Some people sent pre-questions, which is great. We will get to those as well. And we'll have a lot of resources with you in a follow-up email and let you know more about that at the end. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Kate. Thanks, Kate. All right, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Slater. Um, let me just get to my notes because as nice as those slides were. Um, hello, so my name is Kate Slater and I am a white woman. I, um, as Jen mentioned, I work at the Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. It's a nonprofit which um, supports social justice and racial equity in the educational sector. It supports students of color in pursuing their masters and doctorates with an eye towards entering into the educational sector. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate hopefully going to graduate this year. We'll see how that goes. But my dissertation um, centers the experiences of underrepresented minoritized students at predominantly white institutions um, and factors that contribute to their persistence um, in, their, in their undergraduate careers. And I'm also a lecturer for the course Teaching Race here at UNH. So there are other aspects to my identity. Um, my pronouns are she and hers. I'm a mom. I'm a wife, I'm a very slow runner, I'm a yogi, but the most important um, aspect of my personality for per personality identity for purposes of this conversation is that I am a white woman. Um, and in this conversation, I am speaking largely to other white people. Um, I am speaking to white people who are interested in uh, taking on their own anti-racist education. That's my lane, that's my lens, that's my wheelhouse. Um, I do want to put out the big caveat that I'm in no way, shape or form an expert on the history of race and racism. Um, and actually I don't believe that it's possible for a white person <laughs> to be an expert in race and racism. Um, I don't think we can be an expert in something that we enact versus something that we experience. Um, so I wanna give a little bit of context um, to my background because I, I want to explain kind of how I came to anti-racist work and the scholarship that I do and the work that I do. So um, I grew up in Maine, which as I'm sure many of you know, dukes it out with uh, New Hampshire and Vermont as being one of the whitest states in, in the union. Um, I went to predominantly white schools my entire K-12 career. I didn't have a single black teacher during my entire K-12 experience. Um, I then went to a predominantly white institution where I had maybe a handful of professors that were people of color. Um, I went and worked in predominantly white workspaces. Um, my entire life up into mid 20s was me being in predominantly white spaces. And in fact, it wasn't until my mid 20s that I had any kind of significant, substantial, lasting relationship with people of color. And I say that quite openly because I, I want to illustrate to all of you here how easy it was for me as a white person to go through the entirety of my life with predominantly white colleagues, friends, teachers, family members, roommates, and to never, first of all, know anything different or actively seek out anything different. It was so easy for me to insulate myself in a predominantly white space. Um, and then I came to my current job at the IRT. And for the first time in my life, I was the only white person in a room full of people of color. Um, and there was only so long and so many times that I could hear anecdotes from the students that I was supporting about 
racism that they had experienced both in their K-12 education and in their undergrad before I began to realize, and this sounds incredibly ignorant to be in my mid-20s realizing this, but before I began to, began to realize that there was something deeply systemic to the anecdotes that I was hearing, that you can't, I can't explain away these kind of individual stories when you're hearing them over and over and over and day in and day out. Um, so I took it upon myself to really dive in to understanding the systems of racism that exist in all of the sectors of this country, but primarily in the educational sector. Again, that's my wheelhouse. Um, and so I enrolled in this doctoral program and I began to um, take quite seriously my own anti-racist education to understand, to understand the forces that I was coming up against and that the students that I supported were coming up against. I also recognize that my own anti-racist education is never done. It, this, is, this is always going to be a work in progress because I am a white person. Therefore, I represent whiteness. Therefore, I represent oppression um, historically in this country and worldwide. And so one of the first things that I realized when I kind of started digging into this work is that, that I was never going to achieve kind of this ultimate level of like anti-racist varsity level. And I don't mean to say that to sound flippant, but that's a really challenging thing to reckon with at first, I think, to really say, okay, this is gonna be a lifetime endeavor and it's actually going to be a lifetime endeavor where I'm probably going to screw up like again and again and again. And so when you say that, when you say, okay, this is something I'm going to engage in for a lifetime, I recognize I will never get to a space where I'm good enough. And I recognize that I'm going to fail, not just once, but continuously. That's a really challenging undertaking, right? But it's also in many ways, I think, and I don't mean this to sound flippant, it's freeing in a way. Um, there is so much pressure, I think, that we as white people put on ourselves um, in our own anti-racist endeavors to get it right and get it perfect. And in fact, the fear of, of um, getting it wrong often uh, forestalls us from actually taking any kind of action whatsoever. And so with that in mind, if you say, I recognize that I'm going to fail in this, and I know what I need to do is then educate myself and do better the next time, again and again and again. It makes it easy to make that a lifetime practice in many ways. So in this conversation, I'm going to talk about anti-racism, what it means and how to practically engage in it as, as a lifetime practice. And I just skipped all the way to the questions, which was not what I wanted to do. So first, I just wanna clarify some terms for everyone. Racism. This is a word I'm going to say a lot over the next hour. So if this is something where you get like a little rubber band snap every time I say it, get used to it. I refer to myself as being racist in that I have a racist worldview. I live in a world that's shaped by race, as all of us do. I have absorbed messaging about race and racism my entire life, whether it was conscious or unconscious. I've absorbed that messaging from my parents, from my friends, from my classmates, from my teachers. And so when I say I am racist, I am saying I have a racist worldview. And this is not about morality. It simply acknowledges that my world and the knowledge that I have is socially constructed and race is a social fact act in this world that has very real determinants, um, excuse me, that very, that has uh, very real outcomes um, and determines the way that people move through this world. So Robin DiAngelo writes, um, and she's the author of White Fragility, one of the most important white pillars is what I call the good-bad binary. The idea that you're either racist or you're not. If you're racist, you're bad. You're intentionally and consciously mean to people. And if you're not racist, you're good, you're nice, you're open-minded, you're liberal, you're all those things that we wanna think we are. What that sets up is that being a good person and being complicit with racism become mutually exclusive. And becoming complicit with racism is unfortunately something that we as white people just are. So Ibram Kendi actually just writes that instead of thinking as racism, instead of thinking of racism, 
as a bad term and therefore a sign that if we have a racist worldview, we are bad people, it, it removes the kind of description of what it simply is. I am racist. I have a worldview that is shaped by race. So I also want to talk a little bit about white supremacy, because I think that's a term that's very loaded for a lot of people. When you think of white supremacy, you think of, you know, people in white hoods riding out and lynching people in Jim Crow era South. It's a very weighted term. But I refer a lot to systems of white supremacy. And when I say white supremacy, I don't mean these kind of, um, these, these particular very uh, extreme triggering examples. I mean simply a worldview that I have been indoctrinated in that sets whiteness as both the default and the ideal. So let me say it again. When I say I have a white supremacist worldview or I am subscribing to white supremacy, I am talking about a worldview that sets whiteness as the default and the ideal. And I'm gonna use a really quick anecdote to illustrate a worldview that is both racist and white supremacist because I really want to show how those terms that can feel very extreme for many of us actually show up in these, these very kind of subtle, mundane, everyday ways. So I work at the IRT. It's located um, in Andover. And part of our programming is that we have a summer workshop where we invite um, scholars of color to come be in residence on the Andover campus. Now, these scholars are 22 and 23 years old. They're adults. Um, and so as part of the programming on the weekend, they are left alone to do what they want. The past few years, we have actually set very stringent rules on our students. And we have said that on Saturday nights and Friday nights, you can do what you want, but you cannot travel outside the bounds of Andover for safety purposes. Now, Lawrence is a town that's right next door to Andover. Lawrence has a very large population of people of color. For many of our students, who are almost all people of color, their inclination might be to go to a space like Lawrence. But we at the IRT, I, I'll implicate myself in this, set this bizarre arbitrary rule that simply said for safety purposes, we want people to stay inside the confines of Andover, which is a predominantly white town. Follow up to that. When a former colleague who is a woman of color accepted a position at the IRT, she was talking to a woman in human resources about where she might wanna live in the area. And the woman said to her, quite blatantly, a woman of color, yeah, I would steer clear of Lawrence. That's really a place you don't wanna be. So I use those two examples to illustrate both a racist view and a white supremacist worldview. In both of those examples, there was the assumption that Lawrence, being predominantly people of color, is somehow less safe, sketchy, using these racially coded languages, um, sketchy, um, not great, not a great space to live in. So that's a racist worldview, right? There are assumptions about the town based on the racial makeup of it. And then there's also the white supremacist worldview. There is the assumption that the ideal in this case would be a town like Andover, which is predominantly white, therefore all of the things that come with it, a particular socioeconomic status, a particular level of safety, never of course occurring to me or this woman in HR that perhaps most of the people of color that were students at the IRT or my former colleague might actually have been way more comfortable in an environment like Lawrence versus a predominantly white space where they felt unfairly targeted or singled out, or they were kind of hyper aware of, of their own racial identity in these spaces. So I use that because that's an anecdote that I'm sure many of us have either had similar conversations to or actively said ourselves, but it shows these kind of covert ways, these kind of insidious ways that a racist viewpoint or a white supremacist viewpoint enter into our daily lexicon and we perpetuate it, right? I'm sure if you had a conversation like this in the past, you've never thought about it in these particular terms. But I'm saying it to simply show how often we perpetuate racist or white supremacist messaging without even being aware of it, okay? So a lot of acts of racism and white supremacy are not these overt, horrific acts. They're not often the intentional acts of evil people. 
they're covert acts and they happen every day when our biases and our prejudices as white people come out in these particular ways. So anti-racism, by contrast, fights against racist and white supremacist worldviews. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what anti-racism means just a little bit later. I also want to clarify something else. So I very intentionally use language around racism, white supremacy, and anti-racism. I also want to clarify that in this conversation, I'm going to use the language of freedom very specifically. It was actually pointed out to me only three weeks ago that in all my time as an anti-racist scholar and an anti-racist educator and an educator in general, I had never used the word liberation to describe the ultimate end goal of my own anti-racist endeavors. There are so many terms out there that we kind of dance around, equity, multiculturalism, tolerance, cultural competency, and every one of these terms are very powerful in their own right. But for me, they are less than the ultimate goal. If you are engaged in anti-racist endeavors, if you are an anti-racist, the ultimate goal is the liberation from oppression for black and brown people in this country. And that means it is not about, it's not about your own edification. It's not about your own, um, journey through anti-racism. It's actually not about you. And if for a minute you lose sight that that's what the ultimate goal is, that all of these things you're engaging in is so you can slowly move the needle towards liberation, then you're losing sight of the endeavor. So I'm going to use language of liberation and freedom and oppression and oppressor because I don't want a single person on this webinar to forget for a single minute that that is the ultimate goal of anti-racist work. I also want to take a quick moment to, for lack of a better way, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to mess up in saying this, but just acknowledge the moment we're in and acknowledge that for many of you on this webinar, the idea of anti-racism might be a very new idea for you. The idea of what engaging in anti-racist work may be very new for you. And I want to acknowledge that this might be a painful moment. You might have woken up 45 days ago after the murder of George Floyd, and all of a sudden realized that not only racism is alive and well in this country, but actually you as a white person are complicit in it in ways that you may not have ever even conceptualized. That's painful, right? It's painful to be engaged in this work and be looking back over your life and just thinking, oh my God, how much harm have I done? And going through the process right now of reckoning with your white privilege, the shame and the guilt and the anger and the sadness that come out of that, it's, it's a lot. And you might be feeling whiplash, the feeling that you're not doing enough um, towards anti-racist work. You're doing too much. You, you are so burned out from watching podcasts and webinars and listening to um, presentations that you don't know where to turn. And these feelings are completely valid. And I, I, I really wanna say that they are normal. They are a part of waking up two systems of oppression and racism, and it's a sign that you're dialed in. Unfortunately, these feelings are a reality of anti-racist work, of being an anti-racist. Discomfort and shame and guilt, and the push and pull between I'm not doing enough and I'm doing too much, very, very, very much a part of this work. Um, so this, these feelings are probably going to be your reality for a while. Um, they're a sign that you're waking up um, and it's uncomfortable and it's probably never going to go back to normal, which is hard, right? Because we want these feelings to go away. I, you know, I want to stop feeling angry. I want to stop crying because the moment we're in right now, this racial uprising feels so painful. It feels so long coming as a, as a scholar of history, as someone who uses the historical lens to describe the moment we're in. It is so long coming, but it makes it no less painful. Um, but these feelings aren't gonna go away, right? There's that old adage, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So the question therefore is how to be an anti-racist sustainably. We're in a movement right now, not a moment. And I, I, I think we're in a moment that is becoming a movement, but if the movement is going to continue, 
it is dependent on the sustained anti-racist endeavors of white people, which means that we as white anti-racists have to find a balance amidst all these feelings. Because if we burn out, we are, we're no good. We're no good to the movement if we take on this to a level where we can't sustain the work we're doing. And I've been really challenged by this, to be quite frank. I mean, I've been studying kind of systems of white supremacy for a very long time. And I woke up 45 days ago and all of a sudden I have found um, myself engaged in this work to a level that I never anticipated. And I go to sleep at night thinking about racism and I wake up in the morning thinking about racism and it's a lot and I don't have the answers. I, I don't and I wish I did, um, but I haven't figured it out. I simply say that to say that that tension is something that we have to learn to live with and we have to learn how to be engaged in this work in the way that we need to be, but we also have to know how to take breaks from that work and step back so we can come back to the work renewed. There is no way, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw myself out on this, there is no way I am going to be able to keep up the pace that I've been at for the past 45 days. There is no way. Um, I just can't, I cannot live the rest of my life only listening to sources about racism and talking about it with my family members and talking to my friends about it. I have to know how to take a break. And so again, I don't have answers to how to manage this tension, but I want to acknowledge that the tension exists and it's something that we all have to kind of sit in. At the same time, we can acknowledge the enormous privilege of being able to step back from anti-racist engagement, from anti-racist work, right? You know, I saw a post recently that just said simply how privileged it is to get to study racism as opposed to experiencing it. And that's real, right? And I think that something that is kind of inherent in anti-racist work is that two things that are opposing can be true at the same time. They can be in dialectics. Um, and I don't have an answer to that. Like we can simultaneously recognize the need for us to do anti-racist work sustainably while also acknowledging the extreme privilege of us being able to make that choice. But I did just wanna take a time, a little moment to acknowledge that and to acknowledge all of your feelings. And what I'm gonna do hopefully is talk a little bit more about what sustainable anti-racist work looks like. So what is anti-racism? <laughs> I've said this term, I've thrown it around. I mean, if you had a bingo card, you'd probably have won about 10 minutes ago. Um, what is anti-racism? So anti-racism is in direct opposition to racism. Basically, essentially, the premise is you can't be not racist in this society. You either have a racist worldview and whether or not you're aware of it, you are living out your life enacting covert or overt acts of racism. You're doing harm, whether or not you're aware of it, or you are actively anti-racist. So Angela Davis says, in a racist society, which we are in, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And so for many of you, that means that you are realizing that maybe some of the old adages that you have been clinging to as a sign that you are a good person are not enough. These kind of adages, I don't see color, I was raised to treat everyone fairly, everyone has an equal opportunity in this country. You are realizing that not only are those false, but they are a sign that you are not doing enough work. So to quote another, very famous um, anti-racist, Desmond Tutu. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So for me, anti-racism anti -racism is actively combating my own racist worldview, as well as other racist acts to uplift people who are oppressed. So how does one actually become anti-racist or dive into this work, um, especially if, again, you woke up 45 days ago and realized how much you had to learn and that you needed to do better. How does one become an anti-racist? How does one do that work? So forgive me if this is trite, but I really like, I like mnemonics and things like that. So I came up at 5.45 in the morning when I was lying awake thinking about 
racism. The five, I came up with the four S's of anti-racist education. And they're, so they're four simple steps, not simple, actually the opposite of simple, but they're simple to remember. Four steps that you can take to begin your anti-racist education. So the first S stands for show up. And this means physically, mentally, and emotionally. So the very thrust of the book, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, is that white people have a really tough time handling their feelings about racism. And when they are confronted with an understanding of their own racist worldview, uh, the number of responses that they have range from def defensiveness to emotional fragility, where they shut down and cry, to wanting to withdraw from the world, to um, pretending that they didn't hear this at all. Um, it's a huge range of responses to being confronted with our own racist worldview. And I think especially now, in a moment of racial revolution, it would be very easy for many white people to just be like, this is, this is too much. I'm withdrawing. I'm not reading anything else. Um, but at the panel a few weeks ago, Julian Maduro spoke about this, and she said, um, it's not our burden, and she means people of color, it's not our our burden alone to know the racist things that happen. Take yourself out of that nameless crowd. Become actively anti-racist. That's the only way to make change. So when I show up, I mean you need to work through those feelings and show up again and again and again, which means you need to fight the natural instinct to withdraw because you're super scared of making a mistake. Be present in this moment. Do not lean away from this moment. The deaths of black and brown individuals over the past few weeks, not to mention for 400 years in this country's history, the deaths as a result of deep systemic oppression and racism is painful to reckon with. It is painful to reckon as white people with our complicity in those deaths, our complicity in the systems that made those deaths possible. Do not lean away from that. Do not withdraw from that. It is our responsibility as white people to bear witness to what is happening and to show up again and again and again. So if that means physically, that means you are going to rallies. It means you are attending the webinars. It means you are going to the lectures. Mentally, it means that you are dialed in. Dialed in, it means that you are taking these things in, you are thinking about them, you are mulling over these concepts, you are having the conversations with your family members. And emotionally is the last one, show up emotionally. I just finished talking about all of the incredibly painful and uncomfortable feelings that have come up for me certainly over the past 45 days. And honestly, quite frankly, for much, much, much longer. But you have to show up and, and bear witness to that emotion, right? You have to make space for that emotion because if you do not feel it, it's a sign you're withdrawing from anti-racist work. So show up physically, mentally, and emotionally. The second S is shut up and listen. And that means decenter yourself. White people need to sit back and shut up right now. And that's very hard, right, in many ways, because if we are just kind of waking up to our own whiteness, there's kind of this inherent need to talk that out or process it or say where we are or talk about all of these things. Um, it is not our time right now to be centering our own anti-racist endeavors. The irony is that people of color, black people and people of color have been talking about their lived experience as long as there have been oral histories, 400 years, certainly at least um, in this country's history. And so if you all of a sudden just woke up and realized that Black scholars and activists are on Instagram and are saying the things that you have not been hearing up until now, you need to make space for their voices. Validate and recognize the lived experiences of Black people and people of color as salient, relevant, and important. Your own opinions right now as white people do not matter, quite frankly. You have not experienced racism you represent the oppressor. So do not for one hot minute think that your voice or your journey or your story outweighs the experience of people who have actually experienced racism. 
do not presume you know better. Do not presume even that you know different. Um, that's a tough one, right? Because it is coming from a place for many of us of good intentions, but it's not about your good intent and it's not about your questions. Just because you woke up and all of a sudden you're ready to do the work doesn't mean that black people are now your personal therapist, your personal Google, any of the above. A former colleague of mine did an Instagram post the other day and he was like, welcome to the party. I'm glad you're here. The party has been going on for a long time, <laughs> right? So it's not our job to, to borrow that metaphor, to show up and talk about how great the party is, right? We've been missing the boat for a very long time as white people. So just show up and dig in and stop making it about ourselves. There is an app that exists called Your Black Friends Are Busy. Check it out. It is a comprehensive list of resources that if you want to know more about the history of race and racism in this country, you can read. It centers the voice of people of color and black people. So shut up and listen. Listen to those voices that have been telling you all of the information you need to know. The third S is support. And that means financial, probably one of the biggest, but also emotional and mental. So there is a huge, racial wealth gap in this country. The uh, median income for a black family is a tenth, a tenth of the median income for a white family in this country. And that is because of slavery. It is because uh, black people and people of color spent much of our country's history as cogs in the wheel of our own white economic gain. And so how do you interrupt that? How do you, how do you make amends for that? So one of the biggest things that you can do is if you have the means, be financially supportive. Set up a monthly recurring donation. That is not a hard thing to do. Set up a monthly recurring donation to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, the Loveland Foundation is an unbelievable nonprofit started by um, scholar Rachel Cargill that provides mental health counseling services to black women and girls. Support the ACLU, National Bail Funds, Black Lives Matter. Support, support the Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. We've been doing the work of getting, uh, of, of moving the needle of the racial makeup of teachers and professors in this country for 30 years. It doesn't matter what it is. Commit to a monthly, like reoccurring donation um, because these organizations need to be able to count on your patronage. And also represent, recognize that support um, is also emotional and mental as well. I wrote an article called Five Ways to Support Your Colleagues of Color right now. Um, your Black colleagues, excuse me, um, but also your colleagues of color. Offer that support if you are in a position to. Check in on your friends. Um, show your support. Recognize the moment we're in, right? We're in a moment of racial revolution. Don't pretend everything's just copacetic right now. It's not. So show up. Lend your support emotionally and mentally to your friends and the people of color that you love in your life. Um, the last one, which is probably the hardest one, or not the hardest one, the most long-term one, is school yourself. That means do the work. You bought the books, congrats. Now you have to read the books. You've downloaded all the podcasts, congrats. Now you have to listen to the podcasts. If you do not know something about the history of race and racism, and believe me, there's a lot that you don't know, it is not the burden of black people and people of color to educate white people about racism. So go and do the work. Do what it takes to educate yourself. There was a recent article that came out by Vulture's Lauren Michelle Jackson which talked about anti-racism as a vanity project, where the goal is no longer to learn more about race, power, and capital, but to spring closer to the enlightened order of the anti-racist. And that's what I talked about when I say anti-racism is not about you. It is about the, the liberation from oppression for black and brown people. So a way to continue to move towards that goal is to school yourself and, and do the work. For me, when I started my own anti-racist journey, for lack of a better term, and I hate that term because it's very kind of new agey to describe something that I should have been doing my entire life. Um, when I started this several years ago, I'm 
a very type A person and I like checking off lists. So for me, when I started out, I committed to reading two books a month that were either by black scholars or were about the history of race and racism in this country or were about critical theory. I have a lineup every single week of five podcasts that I listen to that specifically address social justice and issues of race and racism. I listen to them every week. And then I try to commit to reading an article, at least one article every single day that is about social justice or racial equity. These are very tangible steps that I take to school myself every single day to make sure that I am engaged continuously in this work. And maybe that works for you, maybe it doesn't. By the way, after this um, webinar, you'll get a list of resources that I've put together that have recommendations for podcasts and documentaries and things that you can watch to get started. But for me, that was a really great way to fold it into my life, right? Because I think a lot of people get so overwhelmed by what they don't know, that they don't know how to take on this self-study in a sustainable way. And you're not going to learn the history of race and racism in the next three months. You're just not. I don't know it. I, and I don't think you'll ever learn the full depths and, and complications of the history of race and racism. But that means you still need to be diving in and trying. And so I think that for many people, the inclination is to kind of gorge themselves on sources and get so overwhelmed that, like I said, they burn out and they stop. So figure out how to school yourself sustainably. Figure out how to fold the reading and watching and listening into your everyday life. Make it as important as any other habit or self-care practice that you would make time for. That's how you engage long-term. So the four S's. Um, show up physically, mentally, emotionally. Shut up and listen. Decenter your white voice, support financial, emotional, and mental, and school yourself. Do the work. If you go off and read White Fragility, watch 13th, the documentary, and listen to a few podcasts, your work is not done. I really want to emphasize that. This is a lifetime commitment. Also, this is just my own caveat. If you do buy White Fragility, and I think it's a great book, I think it offers a very profound framework, make sure that you also are reading the books by scholars of color about racism. I send you a whole list of recommendations, but the irony is not lost on me that the number one New York Times bestseller about racism in this country right now is written by a white woman. No shade again, but think about the optics of that. So, I have received a few great questions, and I know that um, in the Q&A, uh, in the chat box, um, Jen has been collecting them as well. So um, I'm going to answer two of them because I think they're really good overarching questions that probably a lot of folks have. And then, um, Jen, if it's okay with you, we can open it up to any others that come in. So please do type them in. So the first one that I got is, it feels as if anything I say or do is a reflection of white supremacy. Short of withdrawing from society altogether, how can I and others engage in a meaningful and constructive way to change the systemic wrongs? Right, this is everything we talked about, right? The feelings right now are, for many of us who are just kind of waking up to anti-racist work, they're so painful that our inclination is to like withdraw from society altogether. Um, that is a natural response. It is also a response that you need to push through. So you need to fight that off and double down on your level of engagement. You're going to mess up. You have to be okay with that. And that's painful, right? Because I think if you've just woken up to an understanding of racism in this country, you are crippled by the anxiety that you would unintentionally do harm again, and it keeps us from speaking out at all. You are going to mess up. I mess up all the time. I have messed up constantly. I'm going to continue to mess up. That's part of it. That's part of me being a white person in this society. You have to reckon with that. And it's not okay, right? Like it's not okay that you're messing up, but it's still going to happen. So how do you contend with that? When you realize you've messed up, how do you take that knowledge, educate yourself, and then come back and do better again and again and again? It's really hard. It's really, really, really hard. 
but it's something that you have to contend with and it's something that you have to, it's a muscle that you have to flex, right? Be okay with saying, I don't know too. There, there is a lot that you're not gonna know. And I think that a lot of white people get kind of paralyzed by that. Or I, I've certainly found when I want to confront racism, sometimes my inclination is, is like, oh, if I don't have like the FBI statistics at hand to engage in this conversation, then I shouldn't engage in it at all. And that's not the case, right? To interrupt racism, you don't have to, you, you don't have to be a, an expert to interrupt racism. In fact, it's more important than ever that you interrupt racism, even if you're not quite sure what it is that's wrong about it. If something is landing wrong with you, there's a sign it is probably wrong. So if that's a kind of sketchy comment that your colleague says, speak up. And it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know why that didn't land right, but I, I'm not understanding your, your intentionality behind that. Can you explain it to me? More than ever, it is our it is on us to interrupt racism when we see it in both covert and overt forms. And we do not have to be experts to do that. We just have to be committed. I think another thing that's really important is just normalizing conversations around race and racism. You know, there's, it still feels very uncomfortable for most people in this country to talk about. Not for me, I mean, my husband sometimes is like, can we please, we have to talk about something else. Like you've been talking about it all day. But I think that the only way that you can begin to grapple with these concepts is by talking it out. Certainly you're not going to work through understandings of white supremacy in a vacuum. So find people that you can talk it out with, normalize conversations with your family members, with your friends, with colleagues. The more and more we treat race as something that we can't talk about, the less we are able to show up and actually interrupt racism as anti-racist. So normalize those conversations. So that actually brings me to my second point, which is, um, or excuse me, my second question. So I got the question, I teach kindergarten in a mostly white community. I'm not sure where to start this conversation. So um, what I think the person is saying here is, is essentially like, how do I teach anti-racism to kids? I think. That's how I'm going to answer it. Um, so if that was not your intention, please write it in the, in the questions. So again, normalize conversations about race and racism. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have had the experience or remember an experience where, uh, let, let's just say, I'll use myself as an example. I was in a grocery store when I was like five years old, and I still remember saying to my mom, mom, that woman's black, and my mother, how do you think she responded? Was like, shh, don't say that. That's rude. Sh so shut down a conversation about race and racism. And that was not, that was not coming out of mean spiritedness. It certainly wasn't coming out of her awareness of her own racist worldview. She was raised in a time where it was considered rude to talk about race and racism. But if you inculcate your kids in that kind of mindset, they are never gonna feel comfortable asking questions. They're never gonna feel comfortable bringing up things that they see because they're taught it's not something to talk about. I'm speaking to white kids here. So normalize these conversations. Normalize conversations around inequity, the history of this country. You can talk about these things without necessarily, you know, I don't know, I don't wanna say traumatizing your kids, but you can, there are ways to talk to five-year-olds about systemic inequities that are age appropriate, but also not shying away from the challenges of those conversations, right? Kids are smart. They know these things, like they, they can sense these things. They're smart, they can take these things in. And the more you normalize these kind of conversations and are able to say, I don't know about the stuff you don't know about, you are giving your kids the critical thinking skills to begin to think about these things for themselves. Another thing is talk about a side of history that your children might not be exposed to. Um, you know, one of the things that I heard time and time again in the class that I taught teaching race is how angry my white students were that they hadn't been taught this in their K-12 experience. But I, I swear to God, we, we spent the first half of the semester with the students, their reaction papers were them just being like, how did no one teach me this? And that's because we still have a very whitewashed K-12 curriculum. We still have a curriculum that, um, undermines and erases the lived experiences and the oppression 
of black people and people of color, as well as their victories, as well as their triumphs. So talk about those histories with your kids. Go buy these books, um, listen to podcasts, watch movies together. Try to expose your white kids to an understanding of history that they're not getting in schools. And this is really important, right? Because um, otherwise you are getting, your kids are receiving a very one-dimensional, one-sided understanding of their history that they have no control over, right? And that you have no control over. So the more you, you, you present a nuanced, multi-layered, complex understanding of the experiences of Black people and people of color in this country, the more your kids will be able to engage with this work from early on. Those are the big things I'd say. The last thing I would say is, as an educator, if you feel that the curriculum that your student is being taught or your kid is being taught is too whitewashed or erases particular voices in the narrative of the history of this country, lobby your local school district. Write letters, start a petition, get other parents involved. Um, one of the areas that parents have uh, actually a good amount of say in is the curriculum. And um, this is a place where you can use your white voice to, to really lobby for a more inclusive curriculum that, um, that again, will, will, will fight these racist sentiments um, that are so pervasive um, among white people because we didn't know, right? We weren't taught it. And so now is the time to make sure it is taught. So those were the two questions I received ahead of time. We have um, a lot of questions coming in. If you do have a question, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom um, that we will get to. So let me just grab. Glorious. And let me, um, let me actually just share the four S's of anti-racism so that you can all See the steps. Hold on just a sec. There we go. All right. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. So the first question is, for Shut Up and Listen, is it okay to educate our friends and family, for example, on social media? Not about how I feel, but about the concepts you were talking about, for example, or something I've learned in anti-racist work. I know we can share the voices of people of color, but it is wrong. But is it wrong to also share what we've learned or are learning? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, hmm. I have very mixed feelings about this, right? Um, no. So the, the first answer I would say is no, I don't think, I absolutely think you should be challenging and engaging your friends and loved ones. And I absolutely think resource sharing is, is critical in this. I mean, hello, why am I here? You know, <laughs> I am certainly not shutting up right now. Um, but I think that there's a balance to that, right? Um, and for me, to be quite frank, before I post anything, I have to do kind of an internal gut check of what are my motives for posting this. Because as I wrote about in, in the five ways to support your black colleagues, performative allyship and virtue signaling is a very real thing. And that's when white people are trying, trying to kind of prove we're one of the good white people. And so we kind of feign outrage or moral indignation or we are engaged in the work, but in a very, very superficial level. It's more about our own, our own self-image, right? Wanting to be seen as a good white ally than it has anything to do with actually digging into the work. So I don't say that if you are posting something that's your own resources, your own opinions, that that's a problem. But I do think it's important to do that internal gut check every time you're putting something out there because it just serves to remind you what's the ultimate goal here, right? If you're moving a conversation towards an understanding of liberation for your white friends and family members, that's in line with the mission, right? I hope I answered that okay. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Um, how would you talk about the intersectionality? Mm. Bounce that right. Um, with your example of Andover and Lawrence, because it's not just about race, it's about the intersection of race and class and it's more complicated. Right, 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 right. And that's a great question. And I think intersection, you have to take an intersectional lens when you're talking about anti-racist work, right? Because all of these things feed into each other, right? And that's a great question. So Lawrence, yes, uh, socioeconomically, it's much lower. Uh, socioeconomically, it's, it's a, it, it is poorer than Andover. It is also way less white than Andover. And those two things aren't mistakes, right? 
So I'm not talking about Lawrence um, being not safe because it's poorer. When I said those things, I was talking about the intersection of a lower socioeconomic status and a particular, particular racial demographic. And so it's a great question. We always have to take an intersectional lens when thinking about liberation, right? Because, I mean, without getting to, one of the sources that I recommend is Kimberly Crenshaw, who talks about intersectionality which again talks about the intersections of sexism, classism, racism, ableism, talks about the ways in which oppressed identities intersect. So yes, to that end, Lawrence is also a, so a lower socioeconomic status town, but it is also a more racially diverse town and those things are not mutually exclusive. So for the support, part of this, what is um, the best way to emotionally support black and brown people? That's a great question. And I, I don't think I have an answer for that because if I had an answer that would be assuming that every black and brown person in this country needs the same thing right now, right? Like that their experience is monolithic, right? And it's obviously not. So, you know, I have black friends in my life right now who are engaging with me as if we would any other day. We are talking about ice cream, we're talking about TV shows. I have other black friends and colleagues that are like, I, I do not wanna talk, I'll text you when I wanna talk. And so for me to assume that different people in my life all need the same thing right now is really hard. Um, I think that you can lend, on a very practical level, I check in, and I say, I've texted my friends and colleagues just thinking about you. And um, some of them have texted thanks, which in my mind says, I don't wanna talk to you, white lady. And some of them have said, oh, I love that. Thanks so much, like that's very nice. And they do wanna engage. Th these are your friends, right? These are your colleagues, right? Th it can be very hard to know what to do right now. Excuse me. But I think the worst thing you could do is, is nothing. Um, so I think it's, it's valid and worthy to check in. But I also think that you, um, you have to recognize that not everyone needs the same thing. And that's not a sign you're doing it wrong. It just means that ev not everyone needs the same thing right now. This, I, I really do want to say, though, this period that we are in, this, this racial revolution, please recognize how emotionally draining it probably is, it probably is, for many of your friends and colleagues and family members of color. I do not want to minimize it for one minute. It is probably a lot right now. So please recognize that, I think, at the baseline when you take those things into account. Great. Uh, the next question is, what do you exactly mean by the work? What would be, you know, an example, I guess, of saying what the work is do the work great question so do the work means read the books listen to the podcasts watch the speakers watch the documentaries it means whatever the gaps in your knowledge are go out there and find the resources to address the gaps in your knowledge um, that's what do the work means i recognize even though i teach this stuff there is still so much I don't know there are still so many concepts that I have only a rudimentary understanding of so I am going out and I am learning about that stuff so I can I can interrupt racism from a better and more knowledgeable place again and again and again so that's what do the work means it means educate yourself and find the answers on your own without putting that burden on black people or people of color when you recognize those gaps in your racial knowledge um, as an educator, what would you say to parents who say, can't you just focus on the curriculum? This is too much for my kids. Good Lord. I mean, it's a good question, but it's kind of like, do you want your kids to develop critical thinking? <laughs> I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be shady in that, but K-12 curriculum if you actually dive into the history of how it's created, if you dive into any kind of nuanced understanding of how K-12 curriculum is created, 
it is problematic. It is at the whims of different administrations, what stories it chooses to include versus what stories it chooses to erase all over the place. So no, I don't trust the curriculum because my K-12 is what led me to a position where I was 26 years old before I realized systemic racism existed in this country. So first of all, your kids can handle it and your kids should be taught to think critically about the information they're receiving. The number one thing I said in my course and my students got so sick of it, I was like, whose stories are being told and why? And who has the power in this dynamic? If you think about an understanding of race and racism as systems of power and privilege, then absolutely your kids can handle it and your kids should be, should be taught, it, not even if they're questioning, you know, they should be taught to question who is giving them this information, who is in the position to tell them what knowledge is valuable and what isn't. And maybe that's revolutionary of me, but I certainly resent many things about my K-12 curriculum and my students felt the same. So I think the worst case scenario for me is that my daughter, who's 18 months old right now, doesn't come to an understanding of race and racism in this country until she's in her 20s. What an absolute failure that would be on my behalf. There is a question. What are some ways to help the fight specifically in terms of the problem of police and unequal treatment of black people? I, mm, I wish I had a simpler answer for this. Um, I think practically speaking, um, if you are comfortable with it, if you are committed to standing up against um, police brutality and in this country, then one of the best things that you can do is actually show up to protest if you're comfortable with it. And I don't, I know in the time of COVID, I can't necessarily sanction that. And I, I'm not for anyone who's not comfortable. But one of the number one things that we as white people can do is actually show up, put our bodies on the line in the same way that black and brown people have been for centuries. Another thing that you can do is begin to really educate yourself around the terminology around police and the criminal justice system in this country. Watch 13th, watch the Khalif Browder documentary, watch When They See Us. Um, read articles about what it means to defund versus abolish the police. Read Angela Davis. Really arm yourself with an understanding of how this system has existed, how we got to this current moment. Um, I think really this is an opportunity to get involved on the local level, to learn about, if, if this is something you're committed to, to learn about where your local police budgets come from, how they are allocated, how they have evolved over the past few years. Um, that is a really, really good place to start if you wanna kind of start digging into that. I also wrote an article that came out on NBC called, um, that basically um, talked about all the different terminology around the defund the police argument. So please check that out. It's, uh, it really just goes through the terms and explains them in kind of their different contexts. The next question is from somebody who lives um, up in Hanneker, New Hampshire, and she says, or she or he, has been practicing medicine for a while and doesn't really you know, have many black patients, have black people that live in that area. So you know, what would you recommend for her as far, or him, sorry, it's anonymous person, um, as far as, you know, anti-racism, anti-racist education? That's a great question. And honestly, I would say that um, a place where you could probably start is in educating other white colleagues. The health disparities and health outcomes for people of this you know, color in this country are so, so disproportionate. I mean, one in four black women in this country die in childbirth. That is extraordinary for 2020. And that is a sign of a deeply broken healthcare system when it comes to supporting black and brown individuals. So if you yourself are kind of not coming, not in a space where you can actively make a difference in advocating for black and brown patients, that I think the best thing you can do is start and get in, start to get involved with your colleagues and start to talk to them and educate yourself about the very real health disparities and how in health outcomes um, for different racial populations in this country. That's what I'd recommend. I'm sorry, I'm sweating so much. 
It's all right. It's understandable. Okay, so it's eight o'clock, but we still have a few questions, so we'll try to get to what we can, and then we can all we'll definitely do the follow up at the end if we if people can get their answers. Okay. Um, this question is: I know some people are hesitant to say Black Lives Matter because they don't agree with the organization, even if they agree with the movement and believe Black Lives do matter. What do you think about that, and what's the best language to use to allow allyship in anti-racist work? Uh, uh that, that's very hard for me because I think if you support the movement, you support the organization. The the organization exists to further the movement. And I think if you're really if you are in a space where you are concerned about some kind of dissonance between the movement versus the organization, a great thing to do is actually educate yourself. So follow the Black Lives Matter movement and the hashtag on both Twitter and Instagram. And I think that will show you, um, you know, kind of some of the things that are coming out of the movement and the ways in which, excuse me, the organization and the ways in which they are engaging in the movement. I mean, they are the movement, right? Um, Black Lives Matter as an organization serves to uplift the effort towards racial justice in this country. So that means they plan marches, they organize marches, they organize speakers, they lobby um, politicians, they uh, set up national bail fund. They're, they're kind of doing all of the work of the movement. I think a really great place to start as well is to actually read some of the autobiographies, um, the autobiography, excuse me, by um, Patrice uh, Cullors, who's one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and to follow Opal Tometi, and Patrice Cullors and uh, Alicia Garza, I think is the third one, on social media because that gives you an idea of the people who are actually pulling the strings of the Black Lives Matter organization, what they are doing. And um, I just think the, let me put it this way. I don't think the Black Lives Matter organization is somehow not fully connected and propelling the movement of Black Lives Matter. That's what I'd say about that. There is a question. Um, I agree with what you're saying about being anti-racist and not just not racist. What about our need to be anti-discrimination about race, nationality, age, sex, religion, and all other human differences? I mean, I think that goes back, I, I might not be understanding the conversation, right? But I think that again, when you take an, an intersectional approach to social justice, you recognize that the movement towards liberation for uh, different races is the movement towards liberation for kind of all oppressed people in this country, right? Um, it's the movement towards liberation for LGBTQIA individuals. It's the movement towards liberation for um, uh, low socioeconomic status. It's the movement towards liberation for um, people who are ageist or, or people who are discriminated against and experience ageism or ableism or are, you know, uh, unhoused. Um, the movement towards social justice, I, I think if you take an intersectional lens, you recognize that you don't get to kind of pick apart the pieces of oppression that you approve with, approve of and don't approve of. You recognize the need for liberation for all oppressed people in all of those different modes. So I, I don't know if I answered that question correctly. I would say for those people who do have questions about what intersectionality is, go watch a 20 minute YouTube by Kimberly Crenshaw, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, excuse me, which really picks it apart in far, far better terms than I can because, oh, by the way, she came up with the concept. Um, but I would start looking into that and I would start thinking about, I would do some deep diving or some soul searching into your own your own need to really dissect the two or dissect these different kind of categories and identity markers. That's what I'd say. Great. Um, there's a question, what can we do to encourage and support the transformation of the systems embedded in our society that are discriminatory? That's Honestly, I think, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go way out on the limb here. I think this requires a level of imagination that white people have never had. Because to act 
actually conceptualize, like we, that's why I use the language of liberation because we can conceptualize equality and tolerance and cultural competency. And I don't mean to take away from those terms because they're very important. But can we actually conceptualize what liberation from oppression would look like? For white people, that actually means you would have to contend with the very real ways that you might have to yield your privilege. I think about this sometimes and I'm just gonna use very simplistic examples. For me, it might mean my daughter has um, a harder time getting into college and university because they're not all predominantly white. Not most of them are predominantly white. It means that I might be shut out of particular jobs that uh, I have always felt myself entitled to up until this point. It means it might be harder to get a lease or buy a house in particular neighborhoods. There are very real ways that we have to contend with this. The abolition of police forces is a perfect idea. Could we even conceptualize what that looks like? The criminal justice system has been around as long as slavery. Can we even conceptualize what it might actually look like for liberation? So I don't have an answer to that, but I think that it, it does require some self-reflection and a very real reckoning of what giving up those privileges that we might not even be aware of right now, what that would look like. Yeah, that's what I'd say. I would say read um, scholars like Bell Hooks. I would say go back to the greats and read W.E.B. Du Bois. Those are some scholars, two scholars that I can think of that have these kind of very real ideas about what liberation could be. All right. Just my lights just dimmed. That was terrifying. One or two more here. Um, so this is from a Latina woman who lives in Maine and she said uh, she has a friend who's white and supporting Black Lives Matter, but they're having a um, hard time discussing because her friend has told that she doesn't really know what black people experience with regard to racism. You know, as a Latina woman, she has experienced really, you know, horrific racially motivated behaviors in her life, but she seems to be unable to conv convince the white friend that she does understand. She says, I really want to be open to educating myself. Therefore, am I seeing this through the wrong lens? So I can't speak to that as a white woman. I can't say that. I think I really do not want to overstep in any way. And I can't, this is such a complicated challenge. I think the one thing that I could say is I, I don't think any of us could ever do enough to understand to try to understand and conceptualize the black experience in this country. I don't think any of us could ever do enough to do that. I, I know this sounds very simplistic, but my Instagram stories, I have people that I watch every day. These are black scholars, black activists, um, you know, black culture writers, black artists who are talking very frankly about their own experience. And for me, it has just been bearing witness to those experiences. Now it's on Instagram Live, so you know it, it, a lot of people are bearing witness, but I think the more and more we bear witness to the stories that Black people and people of color are putting out there, the more we can begin to understand how we got to this moment we're at and what our complicity in it is. Um, I do think that, my dog just howls. <laughs> I, do, I do think that, um, again, it, it it might be worth it to have a conversation with your friend about what it means to kind of play the, play the, you're, you're not the most oppressed person of color group in this country, so you don't know. It, it, it doesn't sound that simplistic, but while there is absolutely a profound anti-blackness sewn up in the American history and in our current day because of slavery, that doesn't in any way diminish the struggles that you have experienced as a Latinx individual. And so, for her to kind of say, but you haven't experienced that, diminishes your lived experience. And I think that that's something that you, you should probably bring up with her. While also doing your own work to fully understand the complexities of anti-Blackness as they make themselves manifest today. Okay, I'm gonna have this be the last question and then I definitely for the other people who did not get their questions answered because there's more here that we just didn't get to. Um, we will download them and, you know, communicate with Kate about if there's ways to answer them. But 
the last question is, and I love this question, <laughs> um, how do you keep faith in humanity after watching the news? Uh, <laughs> I'm only laughing because Jen knows <laughs> that mine has been tested. Um, that's a very heavy question to finish with. I think for me, quite frankly, it is very hard as someone who studies of race and racism to not feel as if the long arc of history will never bend towards justice in this country. It is very hard not to feel that. It is very hard to not look at the news now and just think these are the same, same old, same old. I think that in many ways we have to, in some ways we have to focus on the minor wins that we've had. And there have been some, historically, of course, there have been amendments that have passed the, the voting, the voter, the Voting Right Act, I, I might not even be getting that right. Um, you know, these are very, very real victories that have happened, the desegregation of schools, and all of them are fraught victories, right? They have all come with their own complications and challenges, and some might even argue that they're, they're, they're stalemates, you know, they're not even really victories, but I think that you can't negate them. The other thing, and I know this sounds really, really white for me to say, is that I am seeking out not just stories of Black oppression and the oppression of people of color. I listen to podcasts by Black women and women of color that make me laugh my ass off. Excuse me, pardon my French. That have absolutely nothing to do with the current moment they're in, but they're a reflection of Black joy. I read books by Black authors like Samantha Irby, or you know, I read Roxane Gay's Goodreads uh, reviews, and she's got a thing for Channing Tatum. And I, I'm saying this as like an example to just say to to look at the moment we're at right now and say this is an indicator that there is an absence of black joy or black creativity or black thriving or the thriving or creativity or joy of people of color in this country is is dead wrong is dead wrong so i think put yourself in the way of people that are that are putting this joy out there as well and recognize that black people and people of color have always thrived in this country in in ways it, even despite the unbelievable systemic oppression they face they haven't just survived many of them have thrived and so focus on that as well without detracting from the moment we're in and all the work that we as white people have to do to still continue to dismantle these systems the ultimate goal is that all black people and people of color can thrive all of them not just, a, not just some of them, not just some of them can feel joy, not some of them can just create and have space to, to thrive and be successful and feel joy and, and feel a whole human experience. But there are black people and people of color in this country, too many, far, far, far too many that are just surviving. And so that's, that's the ultimate goal of liberation, right? That was a, that was a heavy one to end on, Jen. Wow. I know. Sorry. And you almost <laughs> made it through the whole thing without swearing. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, it was so close. I tried so hard. I'm sorry. It was so uh, close. Um, okay. So thank you to everybody. Like I said, we will look at those questions. We can download them that we did not get to. And here's some information about Kate. Uh, slide showing right now. We will send you uh, quite a bit of follow-up information via an email and this webinar has been recorded so we will have it online in a couple of days if there's anybody you feel missed it and would benefit from it we'd love you to uh, tell them to tune in online as well yes so thank you so much Kate for taking all this time of preparing course. and presenting right now this was really great and I learned a lot and I hope everybody out there learned a lot as well yes thank you everyone and please do if if you if you have questions if you are interested in partnering with me, if you would like me to talk to your organization or speak to a class or even just have questions, my email is right there. I'm putting it out there. Please, please, please feel free to email me. Um, and I would also highly, highly urge you to check out the Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. It's located at Andover. It is an extraordinary nonprofit that has been doing a lot of heavy lift for a very long time with um, uh, you know, with a scrappy little office of seven people, we've had over 3,000 scholars of color pursue their masters and PhDs. 
um, which is really extraordinary. So please do check them out. And please feel free to email me. And thank you again, Jen. This was wonderful. And um, thank you all. And do the work. Great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great rest of your night.